what's your title and area of expertise? I'm a research professor at Boston College um, in the psychology department. Uh, I'm a developmental evolutionary psychologist. So I'm interested in children's development and I'm interested in the, uh, how we acquired our nature by natural selection. So I'm interested especially in children's nature. A lot of your research is on play. Can you talk to me a little bit about why this was something that you and your colleagues were interested in? There's a lot of reasons I got interested in play. One of which is that it is something that has been really ignored among psychologists. We, psychologists, uh, even developmental psychologists, you would think that they would be fascinated by play. There'd be a lot of research on children's play, but there really is not a lot of research on children's play. Um, I'm, among other things, author of an introductory psychology textbook, and I, so in kind of surveying all of psychology, I, re I recognized a deficit in <laughs> our understanding of children's play. And um, I think part of it is it's sort of hard to do research in play, especially the way psychologists want to do research. You, psychologists like to do laboratory research, and of course, if you bring play into the laboratory, it's not play anymore, right? So you've got to go out in the field and observe children playing. So. That was part of the reason. I recognized a need for more research on play. I was curious about play. But in addition, I, got, I really got into play when my own son was um, uh, in school and rebelled in school and ended up going to a very radically alternative school, the Sudbury Valley School, not, not far from here where children are free to do as they please all day long. And um, there are children there from age four on through high school age. And um, I was a little concerned. He was delighted there. Um, he, and he was uh, very happy there. I was a little concerned about his future. And so I did a study of the graduates of that school and found they were doing very, very well in life. And then I got interested, well, how, how are they becoming educated? You know, I look at them and they're, quote, just playing, right? They're just playing. <laughs> uh, they're just doing, following their own interests, playing in various ways, all kinds of different ways of playing. And then, uh, so that really is what triggered my interest in play. So here's people becoming educated through play going on to college if they want to. Never took a course before, <laughs> including my own son. So, the, uh, so that really fascinated. So then I got interested. And then and this school turns out to be a very good setting for studying play because there's at any given time, when I was doing the research, there were about 120 students or so. There's more there now. Age four on through high school age, all playing together. Uh, all doing, following their own interests. Um, and uh, so it was a great setting for observing, uh, observing play, including age mixed play. Some of your research focuses on the idea of letting kids, very little kids, age three and four, right. all the way through the older um, groups play together. Right. Is that something that you see a lot of these days? Throughout human history, children always play together across ages. In recent times, it's very rare to see children playing across ages. We segregate children by age. We segregate children by age in school. We segregate children by age even out of school. And we put children into different um, activities based on age. Um, children no longer just go running out and playing in the neighborhoods. Uh, at least in most neighborhoods, they don't anymore. Uh, where you just run into kids of all ages and play together. So, but throughout most of human history, essentially all play was age mixed. Um, when we were hunter-gatherers, uh, one of the things I've gotten interested in is play in hunter-gatherer cultures. There, there are anthropologists who've, who back in between about 1950 and about 1990 or so was a big time for anthropologists to go out and make contact with hunter-gatherer cultures in various isolated parts of the world. And I did a study a few years ago in which I surveyed anthropologists who had lived in such cultures. And I found that in all of those cultures, the children 
from age four on through kind of mid-teenage years, basically our school age years, <laughs> are playing all day long and become educated that way. So that fascinated me because it's very similar to what's happening at Sudbury Valley. I became convinced um, that the reason the Sudbury Valley School works is because the children are not segregated by age. They're playing across ages and the younger children are always learning from the older children. So you, you will see younger children who don't know how to read playing games with older children that involve reading. <laughs> and in the process, the younger children are learning to read. Or you'll see older children teaching younger children how to keep score. They're adding up scores or even dividing or, you know, so uh, tree climbing, the older children are helping the younger ones climb trees. So the, Older what children are always scaffolding the younger ones up into higher levels of activity. And I've become convinced, based on those observations, based on my uh, survey of anthropologists, that the natural way for children to learn is by playing in age mix groups that children are natural, young children are naturally drawn to older children. They want to be able to do what older children do. And interestingly, older children are also naturally drawn to younger ones. They, they enjoy younger children. They, and I think there's a good, I said I was an evolutionary psychologist, there's a good evolutionary reason for that. Because we're all, through, most of us anyway, throughout history are going to become parents at some day. And so wouldn't it be natural that you would want to have experience interacting with younger kids, playing with younger kids, helping to take care of them, nurturing them, helping them solve their problems. And so I think especially by the time kids are teenagers, they're really, and boys as well as girls, are really drawn to younger kids. So the older kids are learning from the younger kids. They're learning how to be carers, how to be leaders, they're learning by explaining things to the younger kids, teaching in a sense. In whenever you teach, you learn because you're, you, you are sort of consolidating the information as you explain it. And there's another way that older children gain from interactions with younger ones, and that is that the younger ones are naturally energetic and creative, and that keeps the energy level and the creativity level higher in the teenagers. So they are more likely to engage in creative, high energy activity when they're interacting with younger kids than they are if they were just with other teenagers. So with all of these positives, Peter, why don't parents let it happen? And why don't the schools let it happen anymore? First of all, I think, I think that until my research and a couple of other researchers, I think there was never any understanding of the positives. Uh, I think in the past, you know, when I was a kid in the 1950s, I don't think anybody really was greatly concerned about the value of play. They just assumed that's what kids do, <laughs> you know. You send the kids out of the house and they play, and your main interest as a parent is to get them out of the house, right? <laughs> And that's what parents did, and kids played, and nobody worried about what play is and whether it's doing any good. It, it's, like, it's like if you're a fish living in water, you don't worry about the water. The water is just there. But if you're a fish out of water, suddenly water becomes something <laughs> of interest. So I think in the past, throughout most of human history, children just played, and they played in age mix groups, and nobody gave it much thought. But now we're in a situation where we're depriving children of play. And we're especially depriving them of age mixed play. And so it's really important that we come to an understanding now of why that's important, why play is important, first of all, and secondly, why age mixed play is important, because it doesn't happen naturally anymore. We have to make it happen. We have to do things in our, in our world, in our children's world, to allow for such play. And we're not going to do it. Parents aren't going to do it. Educators aren't going to do it unless they understand the value of it. What is the value of play? Well, let me, let me uh, answer that by describing a, a couple of uh, f major phenomena. So one thing that I have documented, um, not based on my own research, but by putting together other people's research, is that over the last really 60 years, since about 1955, 
there has been a continuous decline in children's freedom to go out and play. Every decade since about 1955, children have been less free than they were in the previous decade to go out and play. And in any given year or two, it's a small enough decline that nobody particularly notices it. But over that 60 year period, which is basically the period of my adult life, <laughs> this has been a huge decline, an absolutely enormous decline. There's no comparison between the amount of freedom that kids had in the 1950s and early 1960s and the lack of freedom that children have today to just go out and play with other children. Now, over that same period of time that we have seen this huge decline in play, and I might add especially in age-mixed play and especially in outdoor play, um, we have seen huge increases in all sorts of mental disorders in, ch in children. Huge increases in anxiety, in depression. It, the, there, there are certain standardized um, clinical questionnaires that assess depression and anxiety in teenagers. And if you look at what would be the cutoff point for suspected major depressive disorder. The rate of major depressive disorder among young people today is about eight times what it was in the 1950s, and this has been a gradual increase over the time. Similarly with anxiety disorders, the suicide rate is now at least six times for, for, uh, for school-aged children, is now at least six times what it was in the 1950s. So over the same period of time that play has declined, We've seen this huge increase in anxiety, depression, suicide, and various other mental disorders of childhood. To me, it makes perfect sense that there's a cause-effect relationship because that life without play for children, that's pretty depressing, right? I mean, I, well, there's, a, there's a rather well-known um, play scholar, um, died a number of, few, uh, of years, a few, just a couple of years ago actually, Brian Sutton Smith is his name, who used to say that the opposite of play is not work, it's depression. <laughs> um, I don't say that because the grammar doesn't work for me, but the absence of play is depression in my opinion. It's clear, I mean, life with, even for adults, life without play and playfulness, that's pretty depressing. And what we've done is we've taken play away and we have increasingly put children in adult directed and adult judged activities. So school has become a bigger deal than it used to be. The school year is longer. For many children, the school day is longer. Little kids, even little kids have homework these days, which was not true in the past. Uh, we've got all these honors classes. So even the good students are now under pressure because they're, they have to get A's in honors classes or they feel their failures. So we've taken play away and we've substituted all these anxiety promoting situations where children are constantly judged. So in my mind, there's no, um, there's no doubt that <laughs> what we have done to childhood is causing so the, the, the taking away play and adding all these other problems. There, and, but there's some, uh, and adding this constant judgment and pressure on children. The other reason for thinking that there's a cause effect relationship is this, that when children are playing, they are gaining skills that give them psychological resilience, that present. So one thing that children do when they play is they play in risky ways. They climb trees higher than their mom would want them to. They, they dive off of high cliffs. They, you know, and other mammals do the same thing, interestingly. Other young mammals do the same thing. They play in risky ways. Now, why do they do that? I'm convinced, and, uh, and animal behaviorists who study this at animals are convinced, that this is how young mammals develop courage. They are deliberately putting themselves into moderately fearful situations where they're feeling some fear and they are learning, I can handle myself in this fearful situation. This is a kind of a thrilling feeling that accompanies that kind of play. And so I'm quite sure that, w that by depriving young people of that kind of play, we're depriving them of the opportunity to develop this ability to face fear and realize I can handle it. I can master this fear. And if we don't allow them that, then you enter a fearful situation 
whatever it is, and you're feeling fear, and you don't have this confidence that you can handle. You feel panicky, you feel anxious, you feel frightened about life because you haven't had this. The other thing that happens in play, and in, in my mind, it's only play when it's self-directed. So if there's adults there telling you what to do, solving your problems for you, it's not play. So when children are out playing away from adults, they have to learn how to solve their own problems. So you and I are out playing, we're kids out playing, and we get into a little tough, you know, you, I'm, I, maybe I'm a little bit of a bully, and you're not going to let me bully you, and we get into, you know, we've got a problem here, we've got to figure out how to solve it. There's no adult there how to solve it, we've got to figure out how to solve it. I maybe, maybe I get lost, you know, back before we had, before we were all carrying GPSs, right? I get lost in the woods and, and lo and behold, I find my way out or I get in trouble. I do something really bad <laughs> and I figure out how to get out of trouble. I figure, I learn how to solve problems. I learn how to solve my own problems. And that gives me confidence in life. And if I've never had that opportunity, because there's always been adults around solving my problems for me, then I go into life as a young adult not confident that I can solve my own problems. And so I fall apart when problems arise. What do you say to parents? I speak a lot to parents. And um, so, so what I try to convince parents of is that play is at least as important, if not more important, than schoolwork. <laughs> that you should never deprive your child of play so they do more schoolwork. You should be arguing with the school to give your child less homework and more opportunity to play to the degree that you have a lobbying. You should be encouraging your child to play. Don't worry about the high grades. Your child's going to be all right. We worry way too much about grades and doing well in school, and, we, and that just puts pressure on our children. And I've actually published research showing that we, our belief that you have to get all A's to get into college, you have to get into the best college in order to have a good life, this is myth. This is simply not true, but we believe it's true. And children, young children are led to believe, teenagers are led to believe it, and they feel they feel stressed if they're not getting all A's in their honors classes. This is especially true of middle class and upper middle class kids. So that's part of it. And recognizing, so part of the problem that even parents who do recognize the importance of play, then the problem becomes, well, how do I provide it for my kids? There's no kids outdoors to play with. So that be, that's where you have to become creative in some way. So maybe you can get together with other parents in the neighborhood, talk about the importance of play, have a little, have a little block meeting about, so what, are, what can we do to get our kids out playing? Um, maybe we can all send them out at the same, you know, just shoo them out of the house like moms used to do on certain afternoons and on Saturdays. And if we're worried, because so many parents are worried about dangers out there, all right, well, let's first of all, let's talk about whether it's realistic that there are dangers out there. The, the truth of the matter is the crime rate is lower than it was years ago when children were out playing. And, and, and we always have overestimated the, the, the so-called stranger danger and that kind of thing. In reality, this is a, this is, these are very, very rare crimes. But if we're worried about those, so let's do something like have one of the parents, let's work out some situation where one of the parents, or maybe there's a grandparent on the block who's home, who can just sit out there and make sure that it's safe enough, but who's not gonna intervene, not gonna tell the kids what to do, and not gonna solve their minor problems and so on, but to be out there to make sure it's safe. There, there are a number of neighborhoods that have done this successfully. Um, so that's one, that's one approach. So there are things that, whole cities can do. You can, you can, for example, have in the park, have a supervisor in the park who's just there to keep it safe. There's a, um, a renewal 
recently of so-called adventure playgrounds. So these are playgrounds that they, they're sometimes called junk playgrounds. They used to be called junk playgrounds. They're playgrounds that are sort of modeled after an old-fashioned dump. <laughs> you know, kids love to play in dumps. I used to play in dumps as a kid. There's old tires, there's bores, there's hammers and tools, and there's trees that you can climb, and there's things you can build. And these adventure playgrounds are fenced in, and you have to stay within that fenced area to play. And there is typically one or two adults there who are play workers. They're trained to be present without being present, to be present in case of any real danger. And in most adventure playgrounds, parents are not allowed. So parents have to stay outside of that fenced in area. And, in, uh, and there's typically a sign saying, please let your your, child, your children can solve their own problems. Please let them do so. And the parents are encouraged to stay away. In Europe, the parents usually go home. In our country, the parents stay there hanging around <laughs> outside, but trying to sit on their hands and not <laughs> intervene. So that's a, that, there's a growing number of these. Um, then there are schools, like the school on uh, the, the whole school district on Long Island, the Patchogue Medford School District, that, is, that has instituted an hour a week of free play, where all the children, all grades together, are playing freely, making use of the whole school. You know, an hour a week is not enough, but it's a beginning. And so we're seeing, we're seeing things that can be done, that are beginning to be done. But the first thing that happen, has to happen is parents have to want this to happen. If enough parents want this to happen, they can find a way to make it happen. What's an ideal amount of time? I'm tempted to say all the time. <laughs> so when I look at hunter-gatherer cultures, the children from age four on through mid-teenage years are playing all day long, or at least they're free to play all day long. I mean, sometimes they're resting in the hammock. Sometimes they're sitting and gabbing with one another. They're not always actively playing, but they're free to play all the time. True also at the Sudbury Valley School, all day long they're free to play. When I was a kid, uh, I would say that the amount of time that I was playing with other kids was at least equivalent to the amount of time I was in school. So I was a, if a school day was six, day, six hours long, first of all, when I was in elementary school, we had two hours outdoors. In, of those six hours of elementary school, we had half an hour recess in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon, a full hour at lunch. Now, there are schools that have 15 minutes of recess in the entire day, even for little kids. So we had two hours of outdoor play even during the school day. <laughs> and after school, certainly in elementary school, we were free to play all the time. Now, some of us, by the time we were 10 or 11 years old, had paper routes and we had other kinds of chores. But that's also sort of playful and it's responsible and you're in charge of it and there's a no adult directing you, you've got to do those jobs. Some of us had chores at home, but we did those chores at home and then we, and then we played. And we played, and we played until supper and then if, in winter of course in Minnesota it was dark after supper, but when it's not dark you go out and play some more all summer long. And the summer vacation then was a month longer than it is today. We've taken away a, su a month of summer vacation from children. Um, in fact, the total school year is now five weeks longer than it was when I was a kid. So, and kids were free to play all summer long. You never, you didn't send kids to classes or, you know, camps where there was, uh, that, were, that were kind of school-like. Kids were playing freely. So I think that was an, an adequate amount. <laughs> but I do think kids should have at least as much time to play as they have in school. Why are parents so hesitant to let younger kids play with older kids? Right. Are they afraid they're going to learn not the positive things, but the wrong things? We live in an age of fear. And um, I think that there's a number of reasons why parents are, are so frightened. One is that um, the media really, whenever something does happen to a child, <laughs> everybody hears about it. So we think it's more common than it was. I think the buildup of fears has been gradual, but there was an especially rapid buildup of fears in the 1980s. 
Um, there were, I remember hearing um, public service announcements, do you know where your child is, right? As if you're a negligent parent, if you don't know where your child is. When I was a kid, my parents never knew where I was. They didn't want to know. I didn't want them to know. <laughs> you know, that was the typical parent, you know. But by the 1980s, that became, according to these public service announcements, essentially negligent parenting if you don't know where your child is at every moment. So that happened, and that happened because there were one or two fairly celebrated cases of children that were um, accosted or maybe even murdered. I forget the details that there was one, there, there was one very famous case around that time. Around that same time, you, they also began putting pictures of missing children on milk cartons. So you would be having your breakfast in the milk carton there, and then facing you would be this missing child. Somebody went back and did research and found that most of those missing children were actually runaways. They were not children who had been snatched away. But the belief was, the assumption was, that you had as you were looking, that these are children snatched away. And so you got this message and you heard, oh my god, if I let my child go free, they may be snatched away by some stranger and I'll never see them again. So that fear came about and it was exacerbated in a number of ways by the culture. And then once that fear is in your head and it gets passed on and it becomes part of the culture, so then the very same parents that, grew, that themselves grew up free are now not allowing the same freedom for their own children. And then by, by now, this becomes, you know, there are young parents who grew up constraint, who grew up already in, you know, the 1980s and 1990s where they weren't uh, free. And there are people who just assume that children can't be free. Children are not capable of being free. It's too dangerous out there. Children can't govern themselves and so on and so forth. So that's a big part of it. Another, there are other explanations too, however. One is the increased weight of school and the increased emphasis on school and adult-directed activities. Again, this is fear motivated. We are afraid, we're afraid our children are going to get snatched away by strangers. We are also afraid our children are not going to be able to make a living when they become adults. <laughs> we're afraid for their future and we have become convinced that therefore the, the route to their future is to spend their childhood building a resume, right? So they've got to do well in school. They've got to do all these adult directed things if they're going to they can't just go out and play that doesn't go on a resume but if you play little league baseball or organized soccer maybe you'll make the high school team maybe you'll even get a college scholarship so parents push their children in those directions rather than just let them go out and play and they, they also believe it's safer because there's an adult there the truth of the matter is it's not safer there are there's actually research showing that even per hour of activity, you are far more likely to get hurt in an adult-directed sport than just playing on your own. <laughs> uh, so that, so, but the belief is that it's safer. So, so that's happened. In addition, we've seen sort of a decline in neighborhoods. People don't know their neighbors anymore. There's a variety of reasons for that. But if you don't know your neighbors, then you're more likely to think, well, maybe my neighbors are child molesters, you know, or maybe my neighbor, I, you're more likely to feel it's not, not safe in the neighborhood. If you, if you know your neighbors, you know, you know that your child could go into anybody's house because you know them if they needed help or something, you know that somebody looking out the window would see your kid, then you feel it's safer. But if everybody's away at work during the day and everybody's and everybody's kind of hunched into their own home when they're home and they're not and they're not outdoors in the yard as as people used to be more often then it seems less safe how about the um, concern well i don't want my four-year-old playing with a 15 year old because he might pick up bad habits or he might yeah. learn things he's not supposed to learn at, at age four there's a number of reasons why people are afraid of young kids playing with older kids. And I think one of them is we is the same fears we have. We have we we have these fears. We you know we have we have we have fears about sexual molestation. So, you know, when I was when I was eleven or twelve or thirteen, 
I could babysit. <laughs> I was a boy. I could babysit. Who would hire a boy to babysit these days? Even a 15 or an 18-year-old boy, you wouldn't. You would, you would be afraid maybe that this boy is going to sexually molest your child. You would be afraid that, so that's one of the things people are afraid of. We've become obsessed with these fears. <laughs> um, we are also, you know, I suppose there's a kind of sense that young children are innocent and older children are less innocent and we don't want to spoil the innocence of our younger children because they're going to hear the bad language maybe that the older children use. Um, you know, those kids are hearing the bad language anyway, even on television <laughs> these days, right? So I don't think it's such a big deal. The truth of the, I, I do think, and, and there's become a huge fear of bullying lately. So, and the term bullying is a term that's become greatly overused. So we call things bullying these days that in the past nobody would have called bullying. Calling somebody a name, teasing somebody. I've even heard, I've even seen cases where not inviting somebody to your birthday party is bullying, right? And so I think we're afraid older children are going to bully younger children in one way or another. The truth of the matter is that older children are, and there's, the, there's quite a bit of research on this, not just my research, but there's cross-cultural research showing that older children are actually much nicer to younger children than they are to one another. And when younger children are around, older children also become nicer to one another. <laughs> than when younger children are not around. There's something about younger children that brings out the nurturing instinct in older children. There's actually one example of such a study. This was done in Kenya many years ago by um, some anthropologists who, they were looking at children, at boys between the age of eight and about 14, and looking at the amount of their aggressive behavior and also their kind pro-social behavior in the community. And what they observed was <clears throat> that those boys who had a younger sibling, a much younger sibling at home that they were responsible for babysitting, for taking care of, were much kinder <laughs> to their own peers out there in the world. And the only reason they were babysitting was because there wasn't, this is a community where normally it would be an older daughter, a girl who would be doing the babysitting, but these were boys who, there was no sister there to do it, so they had to do the babysitting. There, in my observations at, at uh, Sudbury Valley School and one of my graduate students' observations there, what we observed is that the presence of younger children very clearly and obviously brought out the caring of older children. Older children would see themselves as wanting to set a good example for the younger children. They would break up fights among the younger children. They would, they would solve problems for the younger children when the younger children needed them. So I think, that, I think that there is a belief in our culture that older children are going to bully younger children, but I don't, think that, I don't think that's reality. So bottom line, let your kids play and let them play often with everybody. Let them play and let them play often and find ways for them to play across ages. Find ways for your little kids to play with older kids and your older kids to play with younger kids.